Okay, there we go. That should do it. And I have to tell it I don't want to use it in tablet mode, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Whew. <laughs> All right, let's try it this way. So page 272, number three. So this is, cha this is from chapter 12. And it says, a child weighs 55 pounds and is normal height for weight. So it doesn't give you the height, does it? No. no. Okay. So remember we were looking at that, um, the nomogram on page 262? Yes. And there's a little thing in the middle that's boxed that said for children of normal height for weight. So then you look at the child's height or weight, I mean, you look at the child's weight and it will give you their BSA if they're normal height for weight. So if their weight is um, 55 pounds, it gives you the weight in pounds. So you look at the 55 and what do you get? Point nine five. Zero yeah, pretty. Nine five. Yeah, and, and it actually will be just a little bit less than point nine five. So in this case, we'll go with 0 0.95 because it doesn't give us any other option. Um, so that's, that's as close as we're going to get there. So if we're going to uh, use this nomogram and this is what the book wants you to do, then that's what we have to go with. Um, let's see. Yeah, on page 264, they've got that normal height for, for weight highlighted in red, but it's really hard to read, but it looks like it's also 0 0.95. That's on page 264. Okay, so we're going with 0 0.95 for the BSA. Okay, so that is, what is his BSA? That's the first question, 0 0.95 meters squared. And then it says how many milligrams should be administered for per dose. Okay, so the physician orders amoxicillin for this child. The normal adult dose is amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times a day. The medication is available as amoxicillin 125 milligrams per five mLs and 250 milligrams per five mLs. So here our adult dose is 500 milligrams three times a day. And how does it come? Well, we have a couple of bottles. Uh, I cannot spell today. We available. Okay, so we have a couple of bottles already reconstituted. We could have 125 milligrams per five mLs or 250 milligrams per five mLs. So how many milligrams should be administered per dose? But it doesn't give you the milligrams per kilogram or the milligrams per body surface area meter, right? Yeah, but uh, the answer is 279. So we should use the 250 milligram per five mil. Okay, um, well, let's find out how we get that dose first. So if we look back on page 264, um, where it shows us that normal height for weight in red. And then if you look on the page next to it, it will say, where is it? Right down here. Yeah, the normal BSA. Yeah. So it says the child's dose is the child's BSA divided by 1.7. Yeah. Yes. So it's going to be the um, Child's BSA, which is 0 0.95 meters squared, divided by 1.7 meters squared times what? 500. 500 milligrams, which milligrams. is the adult dose. 
So now the square meters are going to cancel out. Okay, hang on. The answer is uh, 279.411. I'm not real fond of this, uh, my new computer that I spent a lot of money on because every time I touch something across the bottom, I'm looking at a different screen, even though you guys can still see this screen. So I'm, you know, big learning curve, you guys. Thank you for being patient. So 0.95 divided by 1.7 equals times 500 equals, and what did you get again, Saja? 279.411. Okay, so what should we round that to? to 279.41. Yeah, yeah, you could go with 279.41 because that'll give us two decimal places. And then we can round our milliliters once we get to them. You know, we'll see how far we want to round that. So um, you said we should use the 250 per five. Why is that? Because is it, uh, it is the close, this milligram, the closest to 279 because I see like 279 and 250 milligram is the same. It's better than double the dose to 500. Okay. Um, if we use the 250 milligram in 5 ml, 5 ml is a teaspoon, right? Yes. So that's going to get closest to our dose and have it close to a teaspoon. Now you can use the 125 per 5, but if you use the 125 per five, you're gonna to have to give them more than 10 mLs, right? Yes. Because, you know, there's your five mLs and here's your five mLs. A teaspoon is easy for kids to take. It, depending on how big the child is, um, you could have them trying to drink a lot of medication that they don't necessarily like the taste of. So let's go ahead and go with the um, 250 per five. So, 5 mLs gives us 250 milligrams, and we want to give the patient 279.41 milligrams. Okay, so the answer is B, yeah. We have 5 times 279.41, and I'm going to keep it with two decimal places here. 1,397.05 divided by 250. 5.588. Yep. 5.5882. Now, if you're looking at a 10 milliliter dosage spoon, are you going to be able to measure? that amount, that um, 5.5882, or no. even 5.59, if you round it to two decimal places. Uh, no, okay. So the closest we're going to get here is pretty much... 5.6, maybe? Yeah, 5.6 is going to be about the closest you're going to get. In fact, that one's 5.5. 5.6 is a little farther down. This one doesn't give me great markings. I do like the way you can see the level though. And I had to do something else in here last week. So I took a lot of my props back into the kitchen cupboard and now I don't have them in front of me. So uh, let's call this 5.6 milliliters because that's about as close as you're gonna be able to draw that, okay? Now, in the hospital, they may actually hand us a label that says 5.59 milliliters, or they could even, you know, if I'm making an IV, they could hand me something that says 5.5882. But in reality, this is about as close as I'm actually going to get that, um, that syringe to. I'm not going to be able to get it, you know, to this kind of um, accuracy. So 5.6 we'll go with. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so. Professor. Yes. Can you do the um, 
I'll work out number five for uh, also, please. I was having trouble with that one. Okay, and that's on page 267? 273 of the post-test for chapter 12. Oh, okay. I don't know what I was looking at. Okay, 273, number five. Yes, please. So this is the post-test for chapter 12. And it says the recommended dose of meparidine for a child is six milligrams per kilogram per day for pain. Meparidine is um, Demerol. I always confuse it with Dilaudid, which is hydromorphone, but they're a little different, but they're both uh, synthetic opioids, I believe. The physician orders this to be given every four hours for a 66 pound child. The medication is available as 50 milligrams per five ml. So let me not confuse this with this up here. Okay, so it doesn't say how they're going to give it, but there is not an oral suspension form of paradine. So it's going to be some sort of an injection, probably intramuscular or IV, more than likely IV. Because um, if they're on um, Demerol, they're probably in the hospital. Okay, what is the total amount of medication that the child can receive in a day? So if we're looking at milligrams per kilogram per day, what am I missing? Uh, the milligram by dose, by one dose, right? Adult dose. Okay, so we don't have to have the adult dose if they say that the recommended dose for a child. Okay, so, so we actually know, so we're not going to have to use the adult dose and then try to figure out what the child dose is. We already know the child dose. So on this particular one, and I don't think I spent a, little, uh, a lot of time on this last week, um, so this is a good time to go over it. When they're looking at milligram per kilogram per day, a lot of my hospital pharmacists will call it mig per kig per day, okay? So that's in one day, but they're requesting it every four hours. So we have to do a couple things here. First of all, we need to figure out how many milligrams per kilogram, and we have pounds. So we need to convert our pounds to kilograms. And then the second thing is once we figure out this daily dose, yeah. then we have to figure out how to divide that up every four hours. Yes. So, so that's the two things we're gonna do. We're going to change the pounds to kilograms, well, three things. We're gonna calculate the dose by plugging it into this formula. And then thirdly, we're going to divide it by how many doses in a day. Now, if they're, getting, um, if they're getting the medication every four hours, how many times a day is that? Six. That's six times a day. So whatever amount we get in our daily dose, we're going to divide it by six. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Lopez, I, I uh, convert the, uh, the pounds to the kilograms and find the, uh, the amount in the same uh, in the same step, is it is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, if you wanna do that, and especially if you're using dimensional analysis, then you can set it all up as one um, equation. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, and I can show you how to do that. Let me do this one step at a time first, and then we'll do the whole thing. Okay, so first of all, uh, we've got to plug something in here. So let's change the pounds to kilograms. And one kilogram is 2.2 pounds because we want to start with kilograms. So I'm going to start with kilograms on top. And the patient is 66 pounds. So when we convert that, we have 66 divided by 2.2. Okay, and a good way to remember this, especially you know, for me as a woman, you know how we always see pictures of people in other countries like France or Italy or, um, you know, beautiful Turkish women, and they all look so thin, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, if I lived in one of those countries, I'd be thin, and my number here would be smaller, 
but really it's because they're weighing them in kilograms. So yes. it's, it's not, you know, <laughs> but the number in my brain, that number is smaller. So that's how I remember to take my pounds and divide by 2.2. So 66 divided by 2.2 gives me 30 kilograms. kilograms. So now I'm going to plug it in. And instead of these dividing lines, I'm going to do um, 6 times 30 is 180 milligrams in a day, right? Then I'm going to divide it by six because they're getting it every four hours, which is six times a day. Okay, so 180 divided by six is 30. And that gives me 30 milligrams per dose. Okay, so now if I want to set this up to as all in one um, question, and I haven't done this in a few months with these particular questions, um, but uh, I should be able to do this. Let me see. We want to know how many milligrams. It's going to be six milligrams per kilogram. One kilogram is 2.2 pounds. The patient weighs 66 pounds. And then we're also needing to... Um, uh, how many doses per day? Yeah, in one day, they're going to get six, uh, doses. six doses. Okay, so now this gives us basically the same thing, except you're going to have larger numbers when you do it this way. And so just keep track of your zeros. Six times 66 times one times one, I get 396 divided by 2.2 times six, 13.2. Now let's see if I set this up right. Here's where we find out. 396 divided by 13.2. Hey, I get 30 milligrams mm -hmm. per dose. Because if you look at this, um, the kilograms cancel out, the pounds cancel out. Um, and the day, I'm not even really sure where, um, where I should put the day, but anyway, it, it's gonna cancel too. And then we end up with milligrams on top and doses on the bottom. So that tells me milligrams per dose. Okay, and I'm sure um, somewhere in here, the book shows you how they set that up. I think it goes a great deal uh, as far as our practice problems and our examples. It goes a great deal into BSA. And, Ms. Lopez, sorry. Yes. Uh, the day uh, we have six milligram of our kilogram of our day. So the day will. Oh, uh, okay. So it's going to look something like that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I just don't like putting a fraction over a fraction, but that's pretty much what they did then. Okay. So then you, you have this here and it doesn't cancel out until you get over here. Uh, we could, um, yeah, I see what they did. Okay. Sometimes dimensional analysis is easy and makes a whole lot of sense and other times dimensional analysis um, can get a little a little confusing here like that one. So I love it, but I'm not the, the best at doing it all the time. So I'll admit that. Okay, um, how does your post test look for like number six? This is very similar. Number six is an emaciated 100 pound adult has a maintenance order for aminophilin. Aminophilin is for breathing. It's similar to theophylline and it's a bronchodilator. Three milligrams per kilogram per dose every eight hours. Okay, so now this says three milligrams per kilogram per dose. Okay, so they're not, you don't have to divide that at the end because it doesn't say per day, it just says per dose. And then it says every eight hours. 
And then it says the medication available is aminophilin oral liquid 105 milligrams per 5 mLs. So if we're looking at this one, So here's our pieces of information, 100 pounds, which of course we're probably going to convert to what? To pound, uh, to kilogram. To yeah. kilograms. Three milligrams per kilogram per dose every eight hours. And then the medication available is 105 milligrams per five mLs. Okay. So what strength of medication should be given to this patient every eight hours? So let's figure out um, their kilograms first. So they weigh 100 pounds. One kilogram is 2.2 pounds times 100 pounds and when we're doing this with even numbers, a lot of times we'll get some repeating decimals in the kilograms, so. Um, it's 45.45, 45, 45. Yes, exactly. So we're just gonna call it 45 repeating kilograms. And let's see, three milligrams per kilogram. Three times 45.45, and we get 136.36. Okay. And that's going to be milligrams, right? Yes. Okay. So we want 136.36 milligrams, and the way the medication comes is 105 milligrams per 5 mLs. So somebody tell me how you would set that up. I do 136.36 milligram over X mL equal 105 milligram over 5 mL. Then XML equal 136.36 times 5 mil over 105. That, wait, I'm doing this wrong. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I put five mLs over 105 milligrams times 136.36 yes. milligrams over one. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. Right. So let's go ahead and do it that way. Five mLs over 105 milligrams times uh, 136.36 milligrams over one. And then the milligrams are going to cancel. And we have that six, let's see, Point five false. times. 6.5 ml. Okay, so the three just keeps repeating. So again, you know, knowing our limitations on these oral syringes, I would probably make that 6.5 mLs. You could make it 6.49, but then you're going to have to figure out where 
the 0.49 is, and it's gonna be just barely above the 6.5 mark if you wanna do it that way, or you could just say 6.5. Okay, so let's see. On the first one that we did, and that was normal height per weight. Okay, never mind. That was normal height per weight. Okay, uh, how many of you guys have tried to use the equation that I gave you for the nomogram? Or I mean, for the uh, yeah, for the BSA instead of using the nomogram? Has anybody done that? No. No, I started chapter twelve post this, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I solved I solved all the problem, but I never used it. I go to the <laughs> you go to the nomogram. Yes, to the nomogram. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a reason it's in this book, and I think it's because using any kind of an equation that involves a square root kind of scares people. You know, like oh my god, what do I do with that square root? You know. Um, and then the numbers, I have to remember 3,600 if it's metric or 3,131 if it's um, pounds and inches. So that can be a little confusing too. Um, where, how far have you guys gotten on the post test? Has anyone turned it in yet? Yes. Not okay. yet. Yeah, I'm at number 10. I'm to number 13. Okay, pretty good. I turn it in. <laughs> okay, I did actually see that. I, I get these little announcements that tell me who turns in what. And then even if I'm not um, at my computer, I can know, oh, okay, somebody turned this in or that in. Okay, let's look at number 14 on your post test. Well, real quick, Professor Lopez. Yes. So on number 13, that's the one I was working on. It's asking you, I'm just concerned about the one question, how many tablets would be given orally for this dose? Is it want us to give us the answer for both the five milligram and 10 milligram? Well, you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, which tablet would I use? Okay. Um, and if it's not something that you can easily make, okay. We can measure, we can cut tablets that are not extended release, and we can sort of um, decide, okay, how, how do these tablets dissolve? I mean, how, not dissolve, how do they cut? Do they cut evenly? Like, are they scored? Can we cut a half tablet that looks like each size is the same? If we can do that, then can we also turn it the other way and cut a half tablet that looks like each side is the same and make a quarter tablet out of it? Okay, and there are quite a few drugs, including 81 milligram aspirin, chewable aspirin, that we will cut in quarter tabs for children. So we have the 81 milligrams. When we cut it in half, we just call it 40 milligrams, even though it's 40.5. And then when we cut those in half, we get a quarter tablet that's 20.25 milligrams, but we just call them 20 milligrams because at that point, you're going to lose a little bit of the powder of the tablet on your pill cutter. So, you know, we don't necessarily worry too much about that 0.25 milligrams. So we call the quarter tabs 20 milligrams. So drugs like aspirin, where it's not crucial that we get the dose exactly correct, you know, down to the 0.25 milligrams, those we do all the time. But on problems like this, uh, this is diazepam, which is um, a benzodiazepine. It's the brand name is Valium. On this one, I wouldn't use the tablets unless it comes out to like 1.1 tablet. Then maybe I would use one tablet. You know what I mean? So let's go ahead and look at number 13. It says a seven-year-old child, let me write down all these numbers. Seven-year-old child weighing 78 pounds is being treated for status uh, epilepticus. Status epilepticus is where no matter what you do, they just keep having seizures and they end up in the hospital and, and they do treat them with benzodiazepines. Um, they're an amazing class of drugs. They use them for four different pharmacological things. The first one is seizures. They use them for pain. They use them as a skeletal muscle relaxant and they use it as a sedative hypnotic uh, for people who can't sleep. 
but some of them, because there's several drugs in the class, some of them are more for some things instead of other things. So for instance, clonopin, which is clonazepam, is more likely to be used for anxiety than it is for, um, than it is for pain or for um, epilepsy, although sometimes they use it for that. So anyway, I'm getting way off, off the topic here, but um, I just wanted you guys to know that these do come from real life situations. You know, they're not just making up numbers. Um, so they're getting treated with diazepam 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, it doesn't say per day. So this is probably gonna be one dose that we're talking about here. Uh, diazepam is usually a short-term half-life, so they can usually take diazepam every four to six hours, but we'll, you know, it doesn't even say that, so we'll just go with one dose. The medication is available in five in milligram and 10 milligram tablets, and it's also a solution five milligrams per five mLs or and then the, that's the oral solution and five milligrams per ml injection. Okay, so what strength should be administered to the child? So now we're just looking at the milligram per kilogram. So what are we gonna find first? The weight in kilograms. The weight. Yeah, so again, we're gonna divide this by 2.2. So 78 divided by 2.2. What do you guys get? 35.45 continuous. Yeah. Uh, we do it in one step with the strength of the milligram, so I don't have this answer. Okay. Um, so now I, we need to give 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram times 35.45 kilograms. And the kilograms cancel, and we get this 35.45 times 0.3 and I get 10.636. 10 10. Yeah, I got 635, but it doesn't really matter because let's look at our tablets, okay? So how many tablets would I give for this dose? It's 10.6. Do I have any tablets close to that? Yes, the 10 milligram tablet. Yes. Yeah, we only have the 10 milligram tablets. We don't have 11 milligrams, which is what you would round that up to if you're going in whole milligrams. So let's do our approximately equals one tablet. Okay. And then what volume of medication should be administered if the oral solution is used? And this is, we come across this sometimes in the hospital because we have kids. You know, it's a children's hospital. Sometimes they can swallow a tablet and they prefer to take a tablet because they don't like the taste of the oral solutions. But yes. if it's, let's say that I needed, really needed to give this kid 17 milligrams and 20 would be too much. In that case, they're gonna have to use an oral solution. So our oral solution is five milligrams in five mLs, right? Right. Okay, so that's one milligram in one mL. Yes. So it will be also the same, the same number. Yes. So you're still going to get 10.635 milliliters. Okay, so you have 10.635 milliliters. And in this case, you're not going to get real close to that. You're going to end up doing like 10.6 milliliters Six. because the 20 milliliter syringe, which you would have to use, only shows whole milliliters, not uh, portions of it. So 
but you can eyeball just a little past the halfway mark and you'd be really close to that. And then it says, what volume of medication should be administered parenterally? And what does parenterally mean? Injection. Yeah, yeah injection. And now they could do it. I don't know if they do, if they actually use this drug intramuscular, uh, but I know they use it IV for sure. And I think they do intramuscular injections too. So what have we got the there? Same. Five milligrams the per ml. One ml contains five milligrams. We want to give 10.635 milligrams. This is going to be just uh, just over two, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, 2.128. That's what I got. Whether it's 127 or 128, you're going to really give them 2.13 milliliters for that injection. Um, and you should be able to get kind of close to it. Um, there's markings at the... So you're, you're actually going to get somewhere between 2.1 and 2.2 here. Okay, so you're probably going to end up pulling real close to 2.15, but that's okay. You're, you're not overdosing the patient on the second decimal point. Okay. Okay. So, um, number 14 is very, very similar, um, and you don't have to worry about divided doses because they only get one, um, chemotherapy injection per day. It's a long infusion. It takes a while to take. In fact, a lot of times patients will um, pretty much like take a sleeping uh, something medication for sleep and then they'll get their chemo infusion overnight um, depending on the chemo. Some is going to cause too much um, upset stomach. So we pre-medicate with um, anti-nausea drugs. But anyway, okay. All right, um, and number 15, okay, so number 14, you're gonna mark it on the syringe. And what you're actually marking on this syringe is the amount of medication that's going to, going to go into an IV bag because they don't, um, you know, they don't do that intramuscular. It has to be diluted with something. And usually they, they um, don't want to dilute it. They want to dilute it quite a bit so it's not terribly strong. And then, of course, we have um, intravenous fluids that the patient has to use also while they're on chemo because the, having an upset stomach means you can't drink a lot. So anything, you know, a lot of times what you drink comes right back up. So they usually give IV fluids as well. So a lot of times I, when the nurse requests a bag of IV fluids and I know this patient is getting chemo, I'll request two or three bags because they're gonna go through two or three bags in a 24 hour period. And our IV room, the bags are good for 30 hours. So I'll go ahead and order two or three bags for them. Um, in fact, I might even make one uh, in the satellite pharmacy, because it's only good for 12 hours, I'll take that one over first and then deliver the other ones from the IV room later. So that way they don't have to keep asking for these bags of fluids. Okay, and number uh, 15 is exactly the same way. So how many milligrams should the patient receive per dose? What volume would be used to provide the patient's dose? And what vial of medication would be the best choice for use? Um, so, and you have the answers to that one. Does anyone need to see that one worked out or number 14? Um, how, how did you find, uh, how would we find the patient's BSA for number 14? Because it's, the weight wise is off the chart, off the uh, nomogram. Okay, so there's two nomograms. Um, so if you're looking at the one on page, I'm looking at the two, 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 two for the child. 
then you need to go over to the next page where you have the adult nomogram. Now this one will not have the normal height per weight. Okay, so we're on page 263 for the adult one. Okay, so let's look at the adult one. And it says this. What number is this? 14. 14, okay. So it says the patient is five foot 11 inches tall and weighs 185 pounds. Okay, just for fun, um, let's use the nomogram first and then we'll go ahead and do the math because, you know, I love the math. I love anything I can stick a, a square root into just for fun. Not really, but we're gonna pretend I do, okay? Okay, so the height is five foot 11. Five feet is 60 inches. So 60 plus 11, they're 71 inches tall. Okay, so where's my inches at? There's centimeters and then there's inches. There's 71 inches, so I see the 71. And then the pounds, I'm gonna find the 185. And you have to kind of like keep adjusting your left and right hand until you're on both of those numbers. Yeah, the BSA is uh, 2.10 square meter. Okay, I get that too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's 2.10. We'll just call it 2.1. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize the second, the next page was for the adult. I thought it was the same thing. I, and a lot of people do that. Every semester, somebody doesn't see the adult BSA, so don't feel bad. And, and it actually took me a while to see it also. Um, it's a fairly new book, but I've still taught out of it three or four times, so I should know by now. Okay, so then just for fun, let's plug this in with our um, equation. So I have height and, and, and weight in inches and pounds. So I have my 71 inches times the weight in pounds is 185. divided by 3131 and then the square root. So the way I'm gonna do this is 71 times 185, hit my equal key, then to the divided by key, 3131, and then the square root key. So this is how I'm gonna run this through my calculator exactly like that. So 71 times 185 equals divided by 3131, equals, I forgot an equal sign, and now I'm going to hit the square root, and I get 2.0482. So we got pretty close with 2.1, but I wouldn't round that to 2.1. I would just call that 2.05 maybe. So if we do the math with the 2.05 for their dose, uh, it's probably not going to change it very much though. So it's going to be 20 milligrams per square meter per day. So So using the 2.1 I would get 42 milligrams. milligrams. And then using the 2.05 times 20, I get 41 milligrams. Okay, so there's your difference there. Uh, 41 milligrams is more exacting. And I will tell you that when they plug the height and weight into the computer, the computer is actually going to do this calculation here. Okay, the computer is not gonna look at a nomogram. So this is one thing that I did um, tell the author that she really should include that, um, 
this body surface area calculation. And in my book, I put it at the bottom of the page in red. I did this, the metric and then the standard of both of those equations because I knew that I wanted to tell you guys about it because every other pharmacy math book, they have other drawbacks that I don't like, especially the ones that do only ratio and proportion. That makes no sense to me. But they do include the nomogram calculation using the square root. So um, I did tell her that, you know, I love 99% of the book, but could you please add the, the uh, body surface area calculation? So anyway, that's, uh, I don't know. I haven't heard back from her yet on that. <laughs> okay. Um, let's look at chapter 13 which is interpreting the physician's orders for dosages and days supply. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're going to calculate the amount of medication when the quantity is not indicated. We're gonna calculate the number of doses of medication in a container, and then the length of time that prescription will last. All right, so if you go over to page 287, we're gonna get the introduction here. So the, we went over the day's supply. Um, now let me go back to page 281, which gives you the keywords. And I went over a little bit of this already. The day's supply. Now look at the way it's written. It's D-A-Y-S apostrophe because the supply is gonna belong to more than one day. Okay, so we always put the apostrophe after the S. Days supply is the number of days a prescription will last. And we have to put this in the computer to get reimbursed for insurance, okay? So um, some, with something like a cream or an ointment, it's really difficult to calculate. And in the hospital, we get away with saying dosage cannot be calculated, okay? Because we don't know how large an area they're going to put it on. So, and we don't know if they're going to squirt out extra and wipe the extra off on a towel. We don't know, you know? So um, we, we, have a, we can get away with that in the hospital, but if you're buying a tube of cream on your insurance in a community pharmacy, it's going to take, um, in other words, the insurance company knows how long these tubes of cream should last or so they think but that's using like one gram per day. But um, most of my pharmacists will have a thing like, okay, if it's a 15 gram tube, which is half an ounce, then it should last about a week. So it's a little more than two grams per day. So if you have a 30 gram tube, it should last about 14, 15 days. So that's, they kind of do that because it's based on average surface area of where a cream is being applied to. Um, you know, so you have something like, is it athlete's foot? Are they only putting it between their pinky toe and the toe next to it? Or is it, you know, a cream for like a rash that's all over your body, in which case you're going to apply it, you know, a lot more than that. So um, anyway, the, an inhaler is a device used to deliver medicine by breathing it in through the mouth or the nose. There are nasal inhalers. And they call these MDIs, which is metered dose inhalers, and that's way back up here. Okay, so a metered dose inhaler, uh, the metered means that it's measured. So one spray gives one metered or measured dose. Okay, so they know exactly how much medication is coming out every time they, they push it and spray it. And then there's a thing called a nebulizer, and the nebulizer is a, a thing you plug in and you put liquid in a cup with the medication and it makes it a fine spray. So you might almost think of it as like a hookah, okay? And it causes the uh, fine spray to come out and then they inhale it that way. Okay, now back over to 287, we'll look at our intro. Now, let's say that you're not gonna become a pharmacy technician. Why would you need to know day's supply calculations? You're not billing insurance companies for drugs. They're gonna do that at the pharmacy level. So why would you need to do that?
need to know how much you need in a day. Yeah, we're going to figure out how much they need in a day. But also, nowadays, a lot of times, nurses will write out the prescription and then the doctor will sign it. So they still need to know how much they would expect to use in a month. Um, and especially if the pharmacy calls them for a refill, and let's say this is a patient that the nurse knows does not need to come in for, say, three more months, the nurses can authorize you know, an extension of the medication if the doctor allows them to do that. And a lot of doctors will allow that. So sometimes it's nurses that are um, authorizing an extra refill. Or let's say that they can't get them in this month, but they're gonna come in next month. Then they can authorize that one more month supply or they're gonna come in in two weeks. So they can authorize say two weeks worth of medication. So you, as nurses, you would need to know how much they would use in a day and then how many days they need, you know, to have their medication extended until they can come in and see you again. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so day supply calculations are extremely important for insurance purposes. And um, so what we wanna do is determine the appropriate quantity for dispensing. And they're using ratio and proportion on this. You can also just do a math you know, this times this times this. Um, or let's look at uh, example, let's go with example 13.1. And this one is giving you ratio and proportion. And let's see. It says the dispense amoxicillin 500 milligram capsules to be taken three times a day for 10 days. So the way that you would write that is This is per dose, right? Yeah, this is a standard dose. This is this is what they always do for an adult. And then your sig is 1 PO TID times 10 days. Okay, so if they're taking one capsule three times a day for 10 days, it's basically going to be one times three times uh, 10, 30, 10, which yeah, is going to give you 30 capsules, right? Yes. Now, most of the time our prescription is going to say number 30 on it, so we know to give 30 capsules, but sometimes it doesn't, they leave that off. So we either have to know the... I don't know how I managed to erase that. Okay, we either have to know the quantity or the duration. Okay, so let's say that it's a medication that they're only going to take if they need it. So let's say that they're taking one tablet, PO, Q, 12, H, PRN pain, but they're not, we don't know if they're having pain or not, because this is something they would take for very mild pain, like, you know, ibuprofen or, or naproxen. Naproxen's every 12 hours. And then we don't know, there's no quantity, there's no duration. It doesn't say how many days. It doesn't say to give them, you know, 30 tablets or 60 tablets, right? So in this case, we would have to call the doctor's office and get clarification of how much they would need. Um, if it says times 10 days, then we would know to give them how many? Here, I think 20, because uh, uh, every 12 hours, so twice a day, right? Yes, so that would be 20 tablets. Yeah, because 20. even though it says PRN and they might not have that pain, they might not need it for three or four days. They might only need it for three or four days we're still going to go with the most they would possibly use in a day, okay? So let's look at something else here. Let's do the same uh, every 12 hours PRN thing again. And let's say that it's every 12 hours PRN paying number 45. What's the day's supply we would put on this? We need to make like 40 23 five days. By two. 23 days. 45 divided by two. 
Yes. So we would take the total quantity dispensed, which is 45, and we would divide it by the maximum they could take in one day, which is two, two. which is going to give you what, 22.5 days? Okay. Round, Will round it, up to 23. Okay, here's, here's the question. Will it last 22 days if they take it two times a day? No. Yes. Yes, it's going to last at least 22 yeah. days, right? Because yeah. they would use 44 in 22 days. Yes. Will it last 23 days? 23 whole days? No. 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 So day supply, you always round down. Okay? Oh, so we, so we round down? We always round down. Because... It's not going to last 23 days if you count 23 days as 24 as, as a day is 24 hours. Okay, they're going to miss one dose. So always round down. Okay, so in this case, if you wanted to give the patient a 23 day supply, the doctor would have to write for how many? Instead of 45, they'd have to write for 46. 46. 46 capsules, exactly, or tablets or whatever. Okay, so we always want to round it down. So this is, this is a rule that you need to remember for um, your exam, your quiz for this um, chapter, and then your final exam. Day's supply, always round down, okay? Are you writing it down somewhere? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, because it's extremely important, okay? Always ran down. Okay, now let me tell you one other thing. Having said that, this is like 99.99% of the time. You may have a medication for something like um, a, um, let's say that it's a medication for sleep. And let's say that it's something like um, Ambient. So you have a prescription for Ambien, 15 milligrams, number 30, 1, PO, HS, PRN, sleep. And let's say that this is for somebody who's like 30, not, not an elderly person, because I have stories to tell you about Ambien and elderly persons. Uh, they tend to sleepwalk and do things like cook entire meals or drive down to the grocery store in their pajamas and not even know that they did it the next day. So anyway, let's say that it's one by mouth. Uh, what is HS again? Like hour before bedtime or hour before sleep. Yeah, so how would we write that on a prescription? I mean, on the bottle for the patient. We would write, take one tablet by mouth at bedtime, right? Bedtime. Yeah. As needed for sleep. Now it doesn't say QHS, so we wouldn't put every night at bedtime, right? Because this is as needed. Now let's say that you have an insurance company who says this is a pretty expensive drug and they shouldn't be taking it every night anyway. So we're only going to pay for 15 tablets in a month, right? So in that case, you're 30 uh, you can't give them 30. And a one month supply is going to be 15 capsules. So you wouldn't be able to give them the whole amount. So that's because certain insurance companies don't want to pay for certain drugs. And you see this a lot with Vicodin. You see it with um, like some insurance companies won't pay for four Vicodin a day. They only pay for like 75 tablets in a day's in, in, a, in a month supply. 75 tablets a month. And this was very common with um, Medi-Cal. And even when you got um, the treatment authorization request, a, a prior authorization, they still would only pay for 75 tablets. Mainly because they don't wanna be sued and accused of causing someone to become addicted. So Ambien is either C4 or C5. It's a very low level of addiction. But some patients, if they take it every single night for a week, the next night, if they don't take it, they're going to be up all night. They're going to be unable to sleep because their body becomes so used to the sedation from taking the ambient. Okay, so sometimes you have to deal with that. 
Now, if the doctor writes for 30, but the insurance only pays for 15, by law, can the patient pay cash for the other 15 if they want to? I think no. I would think yes. I would think yes. yes. They can, because their doctor says that they can have 30 and they can have one at night as needed for sleep. So the prescription is written for 30 by law. We can't tell them they can't have 30, you know, unless it's unavailable on the market. Um, but we can give 15 on their insurance and 15 cash if they want to pay for it. Now they could ask for a prior authorization for 30, in which case we would have to fill out paperwork. And my morning class is learning how to fill out that paperwork right now. And aren't you guys glad you don't have to? For this class anyway. Yes, because the, we start like confusing from chapter 12 or and 13 now is, is more confusing and more hard. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, so, Sasha. yeah. You don't want to learn prior authorization paperwork on top of that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, thank okay. you. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Hopefully, hopefully when, when you guys are registered nurses and maybe even Bachelor of Science nurses or Master of Science nurses, you'll have somebody else to fill out that paperwork for you and that, that would be nice. So, okay, so um, to figure out how much to give in a day's supply, you would do the maximum number per day times the duration. The duration is the number of days. And this gives you the dispensed quantity. Okay, so let's look at this one. This one uh, would be like a uh, Vicodin. And this is five milligrams over 325 milligrams because Vicodin is, what is it? The generic name? Hydrocodone. Hydrocodone. It's the same thing as Norco, by the way. Hydrocodone Vicodin. with what? Vi Vicodin is the same of Norco? It's yeah. the same ingredients. The, I think they changed the dosage quantities, uh, like how many milligrams. I don't think Vicodin comes in 10 milligrams anymore, but Norco does. So, um, but the 5325, the, that's both Norco and Vicodin. It's hydrocodone with what? Tylenol. Yeah, acetaminophen. Now, why did they change it from 5 slash 500? They don't have that anymore. Why? I think the Tylenol is toxic to your um, liver. Is that what it is? Yes, very good. That's exactly what was happening. So patients were coming into the hospital emergency room with liver failure. And when they would question the patient to try and figure out why, you know, a 19 year old healthy young athlete would have liver failure, um, they would find out that he had been taking Vicodin or Norco taking more than was prescribed. And even at the 500 milligram dose, sometimes they were overdosing. So- right. Because uh, I just wanna point out, if they yes. make a prescription for every, what, six hours, that's what, four times a day? So they're actually yes. like 2000 mLs of Tylenol, yeah. Yes, that's, yeah, exactly. 2000 milligrams of Tylenol or two grams. Um, so now the maximum recommended Tylenol is three grams per day and ibuprofen is 3,200 milligrams per day because um, uh, ibuprofen can be toxic to the kidneys because it's mostly metabolized by the kidneys. So they've come out with these and that's one of the questions on the final exam for, the, for my other class, the Systems One uh, Pharmacy Tech class. They have to know um, what the maximum daily recommended dosage is. So, um, so see, that's something you guys probably already know. So very good. Okay, so let's say that this patient just had a tooth pulled and the directions are one PO, Q4H, PRN pain. And it might even say max of six per day. Okay, so 
let's not look at this one. Let's look at this 5325. How many milligrams of hydrocodone are they getting in a day? 20. Right. Six, six per day. Six per day. Six? And, oh, uh, six a day. Oh, sorry. I think four. Well, 20 for every four hours? No, no, no. No, no 30. 30 milligram. So five milligrams times six times a day gives them 30 milligrams of hydrocodone in a day. Now, what about the acetaminophen? Uh, times six, it would be 1,950 milligrams. Okay, so is this anywhere near the three grams per day maximum? No. Marty, what is, what's your question again? Is, is no. this amount anywhere close to three grams per day? No, oh, no. no. No, it's not even quite two thirds of it, is it? So a gram is a thousand milligrams. So three grams. So it's kind of barely two grams. Yeah, is 3,000 milligrams per day maximum of the acetaminophen, which is APAP or Tylenol. Okay, so that's a safer dose, and that's why they changed all of these. There's, there's not even a high dose anymore. Like, you can get 10 milligrams of hydrocodone, but you still only get 325 milligrams of acetaminophen in the tablet. Okay, so this is, I like to add this to our book because when we do these calculations, I want you guys to, to have that in mind as well. So let's look at page 290, number four. It says, interpret the following prescription. So here's where I might need my nursing drug handbook or drug reference for health professions. I like the nursing drug handbook too. My, one of my pharmacists, I started in pharmacy in 88 at a thrifty drug store. Um, and I was not a pharmacy technician, I was a drug store clerk and they would pull me out of the pharmacy. Um, and the pharmacist liked me because I had good math skills. Um, but they would pull me out to sell lotto and scoop ice cream. And I was really bad at scooping ice cream. Um, can you still get thrifty ice cream? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Amazing too. I know. I love it. I love the, um, the, what was it? The malted caramel malted crunch. Oh, that was the best. It had like malted milk balls in it. Mine's is butter pecan. <laughs> I love butter pecan too. I, I don't think there's an ice cream I don't like. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> okay, so, but they made like this cylinder, right? Because if they, they would stick the cylinder in and twist it and pull it out and you would have this perfect little cylinder of ice cream, right? So it was measured every scoop. Well, I would put that in there and because I don't have the upper body strength and especially my triceps aren't real great, I would turn it and I would pull it out and there would be nothing in it and there'd be these little circles in the surface of the ice cream. So uh, they didn't have me do that too often, but I could sell lotto tickets. So they would pull me out to sell lotto tickets and, it, and that doesn't happen today. Today, um, Thrifty was bought out by Rite Aid many years ago. So if you go to Rite Aid today, you will not see the pharmacy technicians scooping ice cream. They're just, they're above it all now. So, which is probably a good thing because I was really bad at scooping ice cream. Okay, so interpreting this prescription, um, Oh, I went way off track there. I was going to tell you guys that I have several nursing drug handbooks because my boss, my pharmacist, Bruce, and yes, I named my dog Bruce after him. Um, Bruce would have me go pick up a new nursing drug handbook at Barnes & Noble every year. And then he would give me the money to pay for it. At that time, they were like $39.95 and he wanted a new one every year. So I would go buy it. And then when I took it 
back to him in the pharmacy, um, he would give me his old one. So I always had the previous year, which is pretty darn up to date. And I loved, I loved him for that. He, he is a wonderful man. Okay, so we're going to interpret this prescription. What do we think the name of this drug is? Trileptal. Trileptal. Um, and then if you want oh, to- Oh, you can't uh, read it, Marable. <laughs> what's that? How she can read it. I'm trying like for 10 minutes now <laughs> to find the letters. <laughs> Okay, here's where the nursing drug handbook comes in handy because if you can tell it's T, the next letter could be V or it could be R. And there's not no. lots of drugs that start with TV. So you can become a detective. Okay. Um, and so you go to your um, you go to your index in the back of the book and you look up T R. Yeah. And then you start to look down the list of TR drugs. It doesn't look like Tretin. It doesn't look like Trexol, but it looks like TRI. So it could be Trias, but it doesn't look like Trias. It doesn't look like Tricor or Triderm or Tridural or Triglide. But then you see Trileptal and you say, oh. hey, that could be Trileptal. So then Trileptal is on page 1058. So you go to page 1058 in your book. And luckily the numbers are up in the corner. Wow. And you could see the availability. Okay, availability is oral suspension, 300 milligrams per five ml, but you want the tablets. So 150 milligrams, 300 milligrams, or 600 milligrams. So since that says 150 milligrams per tab, you know you probably have the correct drug. Yeah. So that's where those books come in handy. And then really what you wanna know is as a nurse, how much could they take in a day? What are the side effects? Is it, can you give it intramuscular? You know, does it interact with other drugs that they're taking, et cetera, et cetera. So as a pharmacy tech for me, I get to stop there. This is the drug I want. So the interpretation is going to be, I don't even know how I did that. Try the full one tablet three times by mouth. No, three, ta uh, three, yeah. One tablet by mouth twice a day. And then what you guys, oh, and it also says the quantity, so it gives you the number sign. Yeah, four and then month it says supply. One month supply. Okay, and then what I want you guys to also remember is how you would put this on a patient label, which would be take. Okay, now it's not writing at all. I don't know why my, um, now my stylus doesn't want to work. Okay. Take three tablets by mouth. Two times a day. Okay, so how many tablets are needed to fill the prescription? Three times, two times 30. Yep, three tablets, two times a day for 30 days gives you- 180, 180. 180 tablets, very good. Okay. Um, 
So then look at number five, same page, or the next page actually, page 291. And it says, what volume of medication is needed to fill the following prescription? When we talk about volume, are we talking about tablets? What are we talking about? Uh, milliliters. Yes. Milliliters. So it's going to be an oral solution, right? Yes. Okay. So um, this is Keflex. You know the generic name? Uh, Cyproflex. Is it Cyproflex? Ooh, that's Cipro. Okay. Cephalexin? <laughs> Cephalexin, very <laughs> good. Cephalexin. Um, and it's 250 milligrams per 5 mLs. And then it says seven days, right? What is, does that mean they're supposed to take it every seven days? No, it would be four seven days. Yeah, that's what it should say. And then what are the directions? Uh, five ml, five ml, four times a day. Yeah. Now, if you're going to give the patient one of these dosing spoons, you know, then you can say five mls. If they're at home, um, you know, and they don't have that type of a dosing spoon, they don't have anything to measure milliliters, you're going to put take or give one teaspoonful. By mouth. Four times a day. Okay, so then one thing they need to be told when something says four times a day, how often should they take it? Should they take it when they first wake up and then at lunchtime and then at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m.? No, every six hours. Yeah, they should take it every six hours, unless it's a little child who's gonna sleep like 10 hours, then you, you know, they still need to spread it out like breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime, unless they go to bed real soon after dinner. It could be breakfast, lunch, right after school and dinner time, right? So, um, or late afternoon and then bedtime. So you, you want them to space it out every five to six hours. Okay, so, um, so that's the right the direction says they should appear on the customer's bottle, but what volume is med of medication is needed to prepare this? So how much are they taking at a time? Five months. How many times a day? Four times for seven days. Okay. Equal 140. Okay. So they should get 140 milliliters, right? Yes. Okay. Now, the way that these things come is it actually comes 150 milliliters. So if that bottle has 150 milliliters, are we going to, and that's how it, how you have to mix it. You have to mix the whole 150. You're not going to take out some of the powder and mix it. You have to mix the whole bottle. So are we going to measure out 140 and throw away the other 10 mLs? No, we're no. going to give them the no. whole. <laughs> okay, we're going to give them the whole bot, the whole bottle, but we have to add something to these directions. Yeah, discard the remaining. dispense. Uh, discard, sorry, yeah. Yeah, discard remainder. So then sometimes we have to tell people remainder means you're going to have a little bit left over. Throw it away, right? Okay. So would you then uh, charge the insurance company the full 150? Yes, you would, because you can't give them 140. You have to give them the whole bottle. And if we're going to mix the whole bottle, we have to charge for the whole bottle. Now, let's say that this patient is in the hospital and we're preparing a one-day supply. So we prepared four doses, right, out of our stock bottle. And then let's say that the child gets on a different medication, but we've already prepared four doses. Um, they don't get charged for the doses they didn't take, okay? 
but when we take them back into the pharmacy, we can't use them for anyone else because they've already left the pharmacy. We don't know what happened to them after we put it in the, the refrigerator out on the unit, okay? So when it comes back to us, and it's the same thing in community pharmacy, if someone returns a drug, we, first of all, community pharmacies, you know, 99.9% .9 of them are going to say we can't take back medications. They can't take them back. And if they do take them back, they get discarded or put in the drug take back event or sent to a reverse distributor. We do not use them for another patient because we don't know if someone sneezed on them, really. You know what I mean? Was it left in the sun? Did it stay in the refrigerator like it should have been? Did it get wet, but it had to be kept dry? We cannot give that to another patient ever. So we toss it, but in the hospital, um, we don't charge the patient for it because they get charged on administration. So when the nurse puts in the MAR in the medication administration record that the drug was given, that's when the insurance company gets charged for it, usually like a few days later, but still. So when we take back these drugs that get tossed, we end up losing money. Okay, and this is one reason, this is one of the very big reasons, besides the fact that, you know, nurses are getting a lot of mo money per hour, pharmacists are getting a lot of money per hour, technicians are getting a decent wage per hour, you know, I'm happy with it based on my education. Um, besides that, and the fact that you have to clean the room, change the bedding every day, clean the room every day, um, and feed the patients, and you know the the tubing for the IVs. You you have all you have to pay for everything, and you have to charge the insurance company for everything. But this is one reason why they end up charging the insurance company a large amount of money. It costs sometimes twenty thousand dollars a day to be in the hospital. So, you know, and that's on an acute unit, and that's one reason why. So if the patient is at home. Um, then we're only charging for that bottle. So if you look at it that way, it's a lot cheaper to be homesick than it is to be in the hospital sick. But unfortunately, that's why a lot of people don't go to their doctor when they really should, because if they don't have insurance and they're afraid they'll be put in the hospital, they know they're gonna have a giant bill and it's gonna be painful to try and pay it. So when I see visitors in the hospital, you know, um, or we see as someone leaving, taking their child home, you know, I'll be like, bye, sweetie, don't come back, okay? <laughs> because, you know, that's a hardship on parents to have their kids in the hospital. Even if they have excellent insurance, they still have to take time off to be with their child, or they have to, you know, leave things undone at home to be with their child. Or maybe they can't even be with their child, which would be terrible. So, um, you know, it's a hardship to be in the hospital. It's one of the, I, I really work in a place where slow business is better for the community, you know? And that was true when I did outpatient pharmacy too. Okay, um, let's look at Can we look for question seven, page 292? Sure. Thank you. Okay, question seven. Okay, so the first, okay, so it says a patient presents the following prescription. And the first question below the prescription gives you a clue. What does it say? How many what? Patches. Patches. So patches. these are patches. So let's look up Oxytrol, and this will tell me a lot more about it because I'm, I'm not real familiar with this drug. See, I, I don't front with you guys. If I don't know something, I tell you. Okay, there's, I have a feeling it's probably oxycodone because yeah, we have, yeah, yeah oxycontin, oxyfast, oxy IR, which is uh, an extended release type, oxymethylone, oxymorphone, oxytocin, that is used in labor, and then oxytrol is on page 1062, 1064. So looking for page 1062. And it's under oxycodone. Okay. 
No, it's not. On page 1062, it's under oxybutynin. Okay, so oxybutynin, okay, is for um, bladder spasms or frequent urination. And then it says, uh, it's kind of hard to read, 3.9 milligrams per day. So let's see how it comes. Transdermal patches, one patch delivering 3.9 milligrams every 24 hours. So it is 3.9 milligrams per day. And the generic on this one is oxybutynin. And not only is it not a controlled substance, it's actually over the counter in some areas. Isn't that weird? They just made it over the counter for frequent urination. Okay, so then it says 3.9 milligrams per day, apply every three days. At, and what does that say after that? 9 a.m.? 9 a.m. Yeah. So it says 9 a. For a minute, I thought it said Q a, and I didn't know what that meant. Okay, so if they're applying it every three days, the next question is how many patient, how many patches does the patient need for a one month supply? 10. Yeah. 30 divided by three, yeah. So 10 patches, good. And then write the directions as they should appear on the customer's box, the box of patches. Apply one patch every three days at 9 a.m.? Yes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, and I'm glad I looked that up because I had forgotten that they had a, an oxybutynin patch for frequent urination, so that's good. Uh, it's interesting too because um, you see this a lot in older women who have frequent urinary tract infections as well, and even if they don't, they have a tendency to have frequent urination. They might have a spastic bladder that just tells them you have to go you have to go and then they go and there's not very much urine so thank goodness we women don't have a prostate gland that would be the other reason men have that okay um, so you have this whole thing is all about how long will this last how much do they need for a certain day's supply so let's see if I can find one with inhalers in it because this we run across quite a bit. And then, and then I want to look at the decreasing dosage exercise because this is, should be in this chapter as well. Okay, um, let's look on page 300, example 13.12. And it says, what is the day's supply for the following prescriptions? Uh, an albuterol inhaler, two puffs QID. Okay, so then you need to know that the stock supply of albuterol inhalers is 200 metered inhalations or 17 grams. So the 17 grams is the weight of the inhaler. 
A puff is the equivalent of an inhalation, and this inhaler contains 200 metered inhalations. Okay, so what, what, the thing with inhalers is they're for patients with asthma, right? So we had a woman come into the pharmacy and I had worked a later shift and I saw her in the parking lot smoking a cigarette. And then she comes in and she comes up to the pharmacy and I'm not, it's not a judgment call, but I mean, if you do smoke, you may be more likely to need an inhaler because it starts to destroy the lung tissue. So um, she comes in and she's got her inhaler and she said, this thing doesn't work. Well, this was the time when they had taken out the chlorofluorocarbons. So an inhaler in those days, you would shake it up and then you would spray it and you would feel this cold spray against the back of your neck. And that really felt to the patients like it was working, okay? Because the chlorofluorocarbons are compressed and when they come out of the inhaler, they're cold. So they would be like, and they would really feel like they were getting some medication. Okay, so then they switched it and they took out the chlorofluorocarbons and they changed the brand name to Pro Air. Um, and so when you would shake it up and then spray it, you would really need to coordinate your breathing and the spray. And you would not feel that cold spray on the back of your throat. Well, first of all, the cold spray on the back of your throat is not necessarily good because your throat has a lot of capillaries and the um, albuterol was getting absorbed into the system and it causes more shaking that way. So they really should just breathe it straight down into their lungs and not let it sit against the back of their throat. So these newer inhalers are a little bit better because they don't come out with so much force. So they would have to shake the inhaler, start inhaling, and press the spray while they're inhaling. So that way it doesn't coat the back of their throat as much and it goes straight down into their lungs. And then they need to hang on to that and hold their breath for as long as they can, at least 10 to 15 seconds, to let that first spray really get in and start to open up the lungs. Now, the second spray that they get is going to go farther in. So the second spray is more effective when they have proper technique for the, the inhaler, right? Okay, so she comes up to the counter. She's got the new Pro Air inhaler. She says, this thing doesn't work, watch. <sighs> I can't feel a thing. And I was like, <laughs> okay, let me have you talk to my pharmacist because I can't give advice, you know? Uh, I cannot give any consultation or any advice on how patients should use these things. But what happened was the um, pharmacist got permission from her insurance to give her a spacer. And, and there's different names for those spacers, but it's basically a tube that has a mouthpiece and it has a hole at the other end that you put the inhaler in. So you spray it and then you slowly breathe it in out of the tube. Um, so she got her to use that and it worked a lot better for her. I don't know if she ever stopped smoking, but it, it was, you know, interesting how we, need, we have to help our patients without making judgment calls. In other words, we can say it, it'll probably help your, your asthma if you stop smoking. But we can't say, well, you're smoking, so I can't help you. Because that's, that's not, first of all, it's not nice, it's not polite, and secondly, you're there to help everybody, even with bad habits, you know what I mean? So, anyway. So let's look at the math on this one. So that it, they have 200 sprays, right? And they're going to get two inhalations four times a day. So the most they're getting is 200 inhalations and they're taking two sprays four times a day. So 200 divided by eight gives you 25 days. Now that's a maximum dosage on this. I have seen two puffs every four hours, which would be six times two is 12 sprays a day. In that case, they would last 200 divided by 12, which would give them 16 days because we're gonna round it down. Okay. Can you give them two inhalers a month? Yes. Well, you can, but the insurance company might charge them two months worth of copays because um, this is one of those things that some patients only take one 
inhalation four times a day. Some patients only use it as needed. So one inhaler um, could last them months and months. In fact, we had an, an inhaler at home expire because my son never used it. He was diagnosed with asthma when he was about nine or 10. And then after he got into his late teens, he just didn't need it anymore. Um, and so the inhaler just expired and he never really used it. So, and I didn't replace it because I didn't want to pay the copay. And also I just figured he had outgrown it. So, and then he never did need it after that. Okay, so that's 25 days, but there is an issue with this. I kind of feel like this is the most common dosage is two puffs four times a day. I think they need to have um, five days more of inhalations. So if 17 grams is 200 sprays or puffs, we'll call them puffs, if they're taking eight puffs a day, eight times 30 is 240. So in that case, I think they need 17 times 240 divided by 200, 20.4. I think they need to make them 21 grams personally because that would give them 240 puffs. So that's just my opinion. I've never uh, written to a um, drug company and said, hey, how come you don't make these in 21 grams? I is just it, never have. Is it, um, is it the 200 um, meter, is that all that would fit in one of those puffs? Is that it's like possible. Maybe it would make it too tall and it would be harder to squeeze. I don't know. Yeah. That's possible. Hmm. Or maybe they think that the average person would only use maybe six puffs a day instead of eight. So I don't know, but, but that's just the standard is the 17 grams and 200 puffs. So, and most of them have a little countdown, a little counter so they can see how many puffs are left. That's actually a fairly new thing. About 10 years ago, they, they didn't have the counter so you didn't know how many sprays you had used. So they recommended that you take the canister out of the inhaler uh, mouthpiece and you float it in water. And, and this was a national exam question for a long time. So you're floating it in water. If the canister floats about halfway, then it's about half full. If it kind of floats on top of the water, then it's empty. And I guess you're cleaning the area also, you're cleaning your canister. You really need to clean the mouthpiece too after every use. But yeah, that, that was a, a national exam question. How can you tell if the inhaler is half full? Okay, let's look again at the decreasing dosage question. Um, and this is not on here, but it was one of your worksheets, right? You remember that with the prednisone? Yes. Okay. So it was 10 milligram tablets. And then it didn't say how many. And it said the SIG was 60 milligrams PO times one day. Fifty milligrams PO times one day, and then it was forty, and then thirty, and then twenty, and then ten. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So then you would just hashtag all the way across. So, how many days would this last? Six days. Yeah. One, two, three. So we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six days. And how many tablets would they need for, for um, this amount? So if we're using 10 milligram tablets, they're going to need six, and then five, and then four, and then three, and then two, and then one. 21 tablets. 21 tablets. OK, so now I actually had more than one student tell me, take one tablet by mouth every day. 
and, but I'm thinking that they thought we were going to give them one 60 milligram tablet, then one 50 milligram tablet, which we could do in the hospital, but most of the time we don't. So, uh, and in an outpatient pharmacy, you wouldn't do that because you'd have to hand them six little bottles with one tablet in each bottle. So, we would give them 10 milligram tablets and our directions would say, take six tablets. By mouth for one day. Then take then, five tablets by mouth for one day. By mouth for one day, then. Then take four tablets by mouth for one day. Yes, and then three, and then two, and then one. Right. And then a lot of times it would say, then stop. Okay, now there is something that we have that is um, better than that now, uh, although we still see these prescriptions. We see this all the time. But there is something, if it's not prednisone, if it's methylprednisolone, which is another steroid, uh, the brand name is Medrol, and they have something called a Medrol dose pack. So let me go to the Medrol dose pack. Okay, it's not letting me um, share that. Okay. The Medrol dose pack looks something like this. It's a, a card in a little envelope and it'll have, these are four milligram tablets and right across the top in small letters it would say take two tablets at breakfast lunch, dinner, and bedtime. So this is the breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime. And over here, it would say something like day one. And these tablets would be blister packed. So then day two, they're going to decrease it by one tablet. So it would say take two tablets at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and one at bedtime. And then day three, two tablets at breakfast and lunch, one at dinner and one at bedtime. So it's going down by one tablet every day, right? So this is more user friendly because this is how many tablets they're taking on the first day, how many tablets they're taking on the second day, the third day, the fourth day. And I think it comes down to about seven days on this one. So day four, day five, day six, day seven, yeah. So it, it goes like that. And these are four milligram tablets. So it, um, it's always 21 tablets. So one of the questions would be like, what is the total um, amount for the dose for the course of therapy? That would be 21 times four. And that would give you 84 milligrams total but that's over the course of several days. Now, there's another one where you start with an increasing dosage, and this is for drugs that can cause a lot of side effects that they don't, um, that they don't want, uh, that they want patients to try and get used to, okay? So let's look at those. This could be like, um, let's say that it's, um, an antidepressant that can cause, say, drowsiness or something. So let's say that it's Paxil, 10 milligrams. And so the, the dose says, the SIG here is 
Okay, so this is the first prescription. And it doesn't give you a loading dose, but it gives you an increasing dose, so it starts out small. So the 10 milligrams is a half a tablet by mouth every day for seven days. And let's see. So th that's going to be how many here? Uh, five times seven, because it's a uh, half tablet, right? So five times seven times 30. No, okay. no, 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 five times seven. Okay, that'll be the number of milligrams, but how many tablets are we going to give them? So if they're taking a half tablet, by mouth every day for seven days, they're gonna need 3.5 tablets, right? Tablets, but we're not yes. gonna cut them for them. So we're gonna give them four tablets for that. And then one tablet by mouth every day for 14 days. So how many tablets is that gonna be? 14. And then one tablet twice a day thereafter. So for a one month supply, we're looking at seven Four. plus 14 is 14, 21, 21 days. So we have nine days, twice a day, 18. Okay, so that's, okay, so yeah, that would be nine more days, which would be 18 tablets. So that would give you a 30 day supply there. So 14 plus four is 18, 18 and 18 is 36 tablets. Now, however, one tab twice a day thereafter and you have a refill of one, how many tablets are you gonna put in the refill? The same, like the, it's not the next last. Yeah, if you give them 36 tablets on a refill, it's only going to last 18 days. Because now they're taking it twice a day. So, so on 60? Refills, yeah. On your refills, you're going to have to look at this SIG. So your refill is going to be refill of number 60. Okay? Because now they're taking it twice a day thereafter. So every day after that, they're going to take it twice a day. Okay. Now, a lot of times, um, instead of saying dispensing a one month supply, they're going to put dispense number 60. However, the, if you do it truthfully, you're going to bill the insurance company for more than a 30 day supply and they may not accept it. So, um, this is why you may have to put notes in the computer about, okay, the first month they're getting 36 tablets. After that, they're getting 60. So it's a little bit confusing. Most of the time we can push it through even the very first fill of 60 tablets because we're just gonna tell the insurance company that's gonna be a 30 month or a 30 day supply. All right, let's look at another one. This is a fun one. So we're giving the patient warfarin, which is a blood thinner, um, and it's used to prevent um, a second heart attack or a stroke. And the directions say alternate five milligrams on even days with 7.5 milligrams on odd days. So you're looking at your calendar. The first of the month, they take five milligrams. The next day is the second of the month, which is an even number. No. Now I'm confusing myself. <laughs> the first of the month, they would take seven and a half milligrams, right? Because it's day number yes. one. Okay, and then the next day, the second of the month, they would take they one tablet. Yes. Five milligrams. So for 15 days, they will take one tablet. One. 
and the other 15, one tablet and a half. So 45 plus, ter, uh, plus 15. No, not 45, 15, 22, okay. The 22.5, we should round it to 23, right? Right. So we're going to give them, <clears throat> instead of 37 and a half tablets, we're going to give them 38 tablets. Okay. So right there is 38. You see this with warfarin, and sometimes you see it with steroids, sometimes you see it with hormone tablets. Um, basically, if it's not available in the exact strength that the doctor wants to give, they can do it this way, where you take a little too much one day, a little too less the next day, and over time it evens out. Okay, I had um, some capsules for a, a preemie, premature newborn, and these capsules contained little pellets. But the pellets were different sizes. Some were tiny and some were big. And my pharmacist, she's our clinical pharmacy specialist for the NICU, she came in and she told me, okay, you're gonna divide this capsule into four medication bottles. And this capsule has to last four days. So I'm pouring these out in a counting tray and I'm trying to count them and I said, but Kim, her name is Kim too, which is why they call me Kim Technician at the hospital because Kim Wa is the pharmacist. So they don't want to confuse us. I said, but they're different sizes. How do I know how to divide them evenly? And what she said was, Kim, it doesn't matter because over four days, they're going to get the whole capsule. Oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, we can do that. So I just eyeballed it to see if they looked like about the same amount of pellets in each of these little bottles. And I put the lids on and I put the seal on them and I marked them and I showed them to my pharmacist and my pharmacist wasn't in the room when Kim told me about this over four days, they'll get one capsule. And she said, how did you know how to measure? Did you weigh it? And I said, no, they're so tiny that they don't weigh on our scale. So I couldn't weigh it. So I was talking to Kim Wah about it and she said, it doesn't matter because over four days, they're going to get one capsule. And she said, huh. And she didn't quite believe me. She called Kim on the phone. Is this right? Is it okay if they're not exactly the same? So anyway, I thought that was interesting because they're using creative solutions for this. And this was a drug that um, treats a condition that eventually might be fatal. But if we're lucky, the baby will live till they're in their early 20s. And hopefully by then we'll have better treatments for this particular disease, which is cystic fibrosis. So that was amazing to me that, you know, that we could be that creative and that it's okay, over four days, they're gonna get the whole capsule. As long as it's close, we're fine. So um, anyway, I don't know what happened when the baby went home. I do know the baby stayed for several months and gained a lot of weight. So maybe by then they were up to a whole capsule and they could have just, you know, mixed it with liquid because that's what they were doing here. They were mixing these little pellets in, um, in their formula or their breast milk and giving it to them a little, you know, a little bit at a time that way. Okay, um, let's look at your post-test number one on page 313. This is trazodone. Uh, the generic name is Desirel. I mean, the brand name is Desirel, but you don't see Desirel very often as a brand name. I don't even know if they make it anymore. They use it a lot as a sleeping pill because it's kind of a minor tranquilizer for um, anxiety, but it does cause a lot of sleepiness. So we don't necessarily use it just for that. And how much are we supposed to give this patient? One month supply? One. Yeah. And it's 100 milligram tablets, right? Yes. That's a pretty high dose. Okay, so then it says, what's the first line of the directions? Whole tablet by mouth every morning. Yeah. Okay. 
then half tablet every night evening okay one to half tablet every at bedtime the last okay. one So I think in this case, QPM could be afternoon. So we would say take one half tablet by mouth every afternoon. It looks like Avery. And then one and a half tablets, PO, Q, HS and then it's it's got an asterisk there I don't know what the asterisk is for okay okay the asterisk is at the bottom of the page notice HS is an abbreviation found in the ISMP's list of error prone abbreviations so we should never use HS you know when we're writing the prescription because it might look like HR which would be every hour so, um, but we still need to know that HS means hour of sleep or bedtime. So here we would put take one and one and a half tablets by mouth. So Kim, Ms. Lopez, this is uh -huh. one, in one day, right? Yes. Okay. So how many tablets are they taking in a day? One and, no. Two and, Two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah. So you have one half plus one half plus one and one half, which is going to equal two and a half times 30, right? 75, 75 tablets. No, I think 90. No, I think you're right. 30 times 2.5, and I get 75 tablets. Okay. Okay. Was that Ian or Juan? Uh, that was me. Ian, all right, good job. All right, so that's your post test number one. Number five on page 315 um, is just like the decreasing dose that we looked at up here. Uh, this one, okay, with the prednisone. And they're using decadron, which is dexamethasone. So number five on page 315 is another decreasing dose. So you're going to add up how much they take every day. And, um, and then it tells you a physician writes a prescription for decadron, dexamethasone, taper. Taper means to get smaller, right? So it's a decreasing dose. Using 0.5 milligram dexamethasone tablets. So the SIG is one PO QID times two days, comma, one TID times two days, comma, one BID times two days, comma, and one daily times four days. So then it wants to know how many tablets are needed to fill the prescription. So at least we don't have to worry about half tabs, right? Yes. Okay. So here's another decreasing dosage. How much would they need for QID for two days? Eight. And then one TID. Six. Times two days. And then one BID. Four times two days. 
And then one daily. Also four. For four days. So how many tablets would that be? 22. Yep, because this is six plus four is 10, plus eight is 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Or eight, and eight is 16 plus six is 22. So you could do it that way. Okay, how many milligrams would the patient receive on each day? For so for and these are um, 0.5 milligrams. Dexamethasone, 0 0.5 milligram tabs. So eight tablets times 0 0.5 gives them how many milligrams? Four. Six then tablets. three, three milligram, then two and two. Why are they leaving the last six days with the same milligrams? I think because they say taper, that's why, so. But they're still getting two milligrams, two milligrams on all of those days. I don't know. I'm wondering, because I don't know how long dexamethasone stays in the body, but if they're taking it twice a day for two days, then they're getting this more often for the two days. And then here, for four days, they're only getting it once a day. Um, in other words, they're only getting, um, let's see, it's still tapering. So here, yeah, they're getting one milligram per day for two days. Here they're getting half a milligram a day for four days. So they are tapering, but they're tapering slowly so they don't go without medication. Because when you abruptly stop um, a steroid, sometimes you have a rebound inflammation or swelling. Okay, let's look at um, number four on page 315. Now this is throwing in ratios and I want to see where that is in the chapter because I don't know if I see this in the chapter. Because I don't think they should put something in the post test that's not in the chapter. So I just want to make sure I see it in the chapter somewhere. This is a compounding recipe is what this is. What number is it we're talking about? Uh, the post test number four. And I don't see it, so I'm not really sure why it's in there. I need to go through this in detail um, because if I'm not finding it, then I need to ask um, the author about it for her next. But, but it's easy, uh, Ms. Lopez, because it's equal and they put Benadryl, uh, Lidoca Lidocaine and Malox, mm -hmm. one, uh, one to one to one, so it's equal. And the total is 180, so I think we can like make 180 divided by three. Yes. Okay, so what, what this is, it is a compounding prescription for a mouthwash. And because it has viscous lidocaine, they, they're not supposed to swallow it because you, you shouldn't drink too much lidocaine. So you would swish and then spit it out. And it's for mouth sores. So patients that are having chemotherapy very often get something called stomatitis, which is mouth uh, sores. So they call this a stomatitis cocktail. They also call it magic mouthwash. 
is it? Why is it more for like me? Professional thing? So you're going to do one to one to one. In other words, the same amount of each one. And you're going to have Benadryl. You're going to have lidocaine, 1%. And you're going to have Maalox. And we actually make this at the hospital. It lasts about 30 days. So we end up making it at least two or three times a month. And so it's going to be one third, right? Because we're going to have three, um, three parts total, right? So one, 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 and then three parts total. One third times one eighty. Be sixty each, right? Yeah, sixty mLs. One third times one eighty is 60 mLs, and again, one third times 180 is 60 mLs. Um, so then you should have 180 total. So you're gonna need 60 mLs of each one. So the first question is, what is the amount of each component necessary to make 180 mLs? And there you go, 60 mLs of each. Um, now, if what if it was one to three to two? How would you be able to figure that one out? Uh, we use like five mil every four hours and the total amount is 180. So we can divide it 180 by six. Um, okay, that's the next question in the problem, but that wasn't my question. But let's go ahead and look at that one. How many doses of medication are available if the patient swishes and spits five mLs every four hours? So it wants to know how many doses. So one dose. Six doses. No, that would be per day. It only wants to know how many doses, not how many days. Okay, okay. Yeah. You're getting ahead of the problem because we've been looking at day supply all, all this whole chapter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 180 divided by five. What do you get? 36. 36 doses. Now, if they're doing this uh, every four hours, and then like you said, they're doing six doses per day, how many days is that? Five. Six. Six days. But that isn't the question. The question is how many doses. doses yeah. Okay, so let's look at this problem again because a lot of times we get, um, we get prescriptions, especially prescriptions that were written years and years ago. We're talking like in the 1920s and 30s where this might say one component, we'll call it Benadryl. And uh, let's say that they're doing uh, one to three to two of Benadryl, Maalox, let me just make sure we don't mix this up, and lidocaine. Okay, so you see I've written it Benadryl, Maalox, and lidocaine, not Benadryl, lidocaine, and Maalox, right? So let's look at the Benadryl. Is that the one, the three, or the two? One. Because I have to do it in the same order as it's written, right? Yes. And Maalox is going to be the what number? Three. Three. And the lidocaine? Two. Is the two. Okay, so let's say that we want to make 480 milliliters. We're going to give them a whole pint of this. So first of all, how many parts do I have all together? Three. Well, I have three different medications, but I have a one to three to two ratio. So let's count up the parts. One plus three is four and six. two is six, right? Correct. Okay. The way that I like to think about this is, I'll be right back.
Are you guys still with me? Yes. There's a reason they call it a cocktail. Okay. All right, so the way I like to think of this is, let's mix some drinks. We have our shot glasses, right? And no, I'm not actually going to pour my husband's tequila. He might not like that. But you get the idea, right? Okay, so we're gonna have one shot of Benadryl. Three shots of Maalox. This is a heavy gallon of water. But you know, pretend it's uh, Maalox or tequila if it makes you feel better. And two shots of lidocaine, right? One and two. Oh, okay, so that's six shots. And in case you were wondering, a shot is an ounce and a half or 45 milliliters. So if I were really mixing this, I'd have nine ounces. That would be a pretty big cocktail, wouldn't it? Hopefully it wouldn't all be alcohol. That would be too much for me. Maybe alcohol poisoning? <laughs> Maybe, right? Okay, so some of this has to be mixer. And maybe some of it is um, maybe a syrup flavoring, right? And maybe only the lidocaine is your actual tequila. You know, that would that would be a decent drink. I might could drink the whole thing, but maybe not because I, I don't drink a lot. So it might be a little too much for me. Okay, so the question is when we're doing this, we have to look at how many parts, how big is the whole thing, which will tell us how big is the shot. Because in this case, that's what we're solving for. How big is the shot? So we know an actual shot of liquor is one and a half ounces or 45 milliliters, but, or three tablespoons. But here in this problem, we're not dealing with liquor. So we're gonna figure out how big the shot is. So for the Benadryl, we're gonna use one out of those six shots. Six times, times 480. 480. Exactly, or 480 divided by 6. It's 8. 80 milliliters. And here, 3 sixths or a half times 480. So 480 divided by 2. By 2. 240. And if, if you didn't keep up with that mental math, it's going to be 3 times 480 divided by 6. six. And you get 240 mLs. And then for here, 2 out of the 6 parts. There. That's 160, right? Yes. Yep. So that's your answer, 80 milliliters of Benadryl, 240 milliliters of Maalox, and 160 milliliters of lidocaine, or whatever the, this particular medications are in here. Now, how do we check this? We add, uh, add, add them. 80 plus 240 plus 160 plus 240 plus 160. What do you guys get? 480. 480. Good. Now, does this seem like it makes sense to you guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
And so basically what we're saying is one shot is how many mLs in this particular case? One part is how many mLs? Look at your Benadryl. Sorry, what's, what's your question again? How, how many milliliters is one part or one shot? Like when we're saying how big is the shot? In this case, because it's not alcohol, we want to know how large one part is. 80 mLs. 80 mLs. So we have three times that of Maalox and two times that of lidocaine, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's what this ratio means. Now, if you guys have your book on you, if this makes sense to you and doesn't seem real difficult, look on page 374 of your book. 374? 374. Now, I don't want you guys to look ahead at this particular page of the book and go, oh my God, I have no idea how to do this. This, what we just did, is the first part of that. This is called an allegation. Is this more like IV stuff? Yes, because we're dealing with percentages in, in page 374, okay? But I want you guys to know that if you can do this here, then you'll be able to do page 374, okay? So don't look ahead in your book and freak out, all right? Okay. 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 I will make a note for chapter 15. Yes. Okay, so even though we're going to be dealing with percentages, it's still going to build on these same principles. Okay. Okay. So it's not going to be too terribly difficult. And um, I want to make sure you guys are with me on this that you haven't lost your momentum. Okay. So um, I'm actually more concerned with the AM class, which to me, um, I mean, they're different. They do a little bit of math in the AM class, but it's mostly, you know, how to fill prescriptions. But I'm not getting very many people showing up for those meetings. And here I'm still not getting very many people showing up, but I'm getting more than I do for the other class. So, um, you know, I just want to encourage you guys, okay, stay with me, stay focused, keep turning in your homework. Um, the homework that I'm looking at looks great. The only homework that I see that does not look great is when I look at my YouTube channel and I see that nobody's been looking at the actual videos, then I know they didn't look at the video. So they didn't sit in, you know, sit in on the lecture. So, um, you know, I'm going to have to talk to some of those people. So, Anyway, you guys are doing great. And do um, you have any more questions? No, thank you. No, thank you. And just, I'm just, you know, sorry, Professor. I yes. will be staying on, on Thursdays from two to five. My teacher okay. said it was fun. <laughs> okay, that's, that's perfect. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Um, I'm still going to reach out to some of the other students and see if, well, to everybody, everybody, but I'm kind of targeting some of the other students that don't, you know, come here because they're at work right now and see if they want to do an afternoon, I mean, a, an evening session. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Of course, the first thing my husband said was, um, you don't get paid for that. And I said, here, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Go watch the game, honey. <laughs> Maybe I won't do it on uh, World Series night, though. I don't mm -hmm. think I get very many people showing up for that. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, I can do that a few times, and it's no big deal. I don't mind. I'm here. So anyway, okay. So um, this chapter looks pretty good to you guys. Yes. yes. Okay, great. So then I'll see you next week. Oh, and real quick, Professor, I have an older book, but it's it's pretty similar. Now, it's um, 
up to chapter 17 is what you have, right? In the books then? Um, I don't, we do have a 17. Um, I'm looking at the wrong book now. We do have chapter 17, which is business math. And I think it's the same in your book as well, right? Chapter, I spilled it on the floor. Chapter 17 okay. is business math. Yes. Okay, so we're going to do that one last. I used to teach it right after chapter three, but um, I'd rather put it at the end because I think we're going to need that as a recovery from the other chapters. <laughs> so the math is fairly simple. It's mostly formulas, formulas for gross profit, net profit, that kind of thing, percent markup. It's very simple, and most of you guys will never, ever use it but we are going to go over it because um, it's on the pharmacy national exam. And I mean, I don't know, maybe nurses will get into the business end of things. If you're working with a doctor that you does not have like an office manager, then you might need to do some of that. So there you go. Okay. Hey, thank you. All okay. right. Thank you. Have a good week. See you next Thursday. <laughs> thank you. You too. I, I have one more question, please. Ms. Sure. Lopez. Uh, do we have a midterm? No, I'm not going to give you a midterm this time. Um, okay. I thought about it, but I'm quizzing you on every chapter and your quizzes are sometimes kind of long. So I consider those um, like a good review for each chapter. And yeah. I am going to give you a review for the final. Okay. Okay. The so, final will have all the 17 chapters. I'm not going to put questions from chapter 17 in the final. Don't tell anyone, okay? Okay. I, so, you can tell your your former, you know, your your fellow students. So don't tell my boss. Okay. <laughs> so we will have the 16 chapters, all yes. of them. Yes. Yeah. And a final. Yeah. Yeah, and there's only going to be a few questions from like chapter one, two, and three because you build on those to do everything else. So. Yes. Um, you know, most of the questions are going to be from 3 through 16. Okay. And I'll give you a review for it as well. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Welcome. Have thank a good weekend. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Bye.